Let us go back 230 years to the month of March 1777. It was the time when George III was the reigning British monarch, and during this time, in a small village in Northern Ireland, a remarkable man was born. He was Patrick Bronte, father of the famous Bronte sisters. Although the Bronte sisters became an English folklore, the Bronte name conjures up a scene in the early Victorian age full of romance and intrigue. But this story is not just about Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights and the tenant of Wildfell Hall. It's a story that embraces unemployment, poverty, disease, opium, and goes back to the time of the French Revolution and the Crimea War. In the Bronte era, unemployment was high with widespread poverty, contributing to starvation and disease. In Leeds, only a few miles away from the Bronte home, 15,000 people were in poor relief. And at that time, Leeds was the unhealthiest city in England. The average age for a Leeds working man at death was 19 years. Patrick Bronte was born on St. Patrick's Day, 17th of March, 1777, in a small two-roomed whitewashed cottage in the village of Emdale, County Down, Northern Ireland, within sight of the mountains of Morn. He was the eldest of ten children. His parents were peasant farm workers and the family lived in a time of poverty and hardship. Early in Patrick's life he became apprenticed to a blacksmith and later to a linen weaver and draper. Despite his harsh upbringing, he outperformed his siblings and at 16, Patrick was tutored by Reverend Andrew Harshaw, who taught him early in the day before he went on to his job as a linen weaver. At this age, he was already teaching in the Presbyterian Church at Glasgow, and then in the parish church school at Drumbally Rooney. He became a resident tutor to the sons of the Reverend Ty, the vicar of Drumbally Rooney, and being in a house of learning and social contact must have had significant influence on Patrick and it was the Reverend Ty who encouraged him to study at college. In 1802, Patrick entered St John's College, Cambridge, a great achievement, especially when considering his peasant background. As a student, he contributed to the cost of his place by earning payments from tutoring fellow students. Whilst at Cambridge, Patrick changed the spelling of his name from Brunty to Bronte, it is believed that he chose Bronte after his hero, Lord Nelson, who was made Duke of Bronte by the King of Naples. It was generally thought that Patrick would study traditional subjects, such as theology, philosophy and the classics. However, it is recorded that he studied some medicine while at St. John's. He graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1806 and 12 months later, he was ordained by the Bishop of London here in the Chapel Royal at St. James's Palace. He enjoyed an early career in the ministry at Weatherfield, Essex, then on to Wellington, Shropshire. And in 1809, he became curate of All Saints Church, Dewsbury in West Yorkshire. In 1811, he became curate of the Church of St. Peter's, Hartshead, in the parish of Dewsbury. He resided here for five years. William Morgan, a fellow curate at Shropshire, was engaged to the daughter of John Fennell, headmaster at Woodhouse Grove Boarding School, Appley Bridge, near Bradford. Patrick was the visiting Bible studies examiner here. Woodhouse Grove School was founded at the Methodist Conference in 1812 for the education of sons of ministers. It was here that Patrick met John Fennell's niece, Maria Branwell. Maria worked as an assistant at the school, moving up from Cornwall, and a deep affection developed between them. Maria was born on the 15th of April, 1783, the daughter of a prosperous merchant family who lived in this house, number 25 Chapel Street, Penzance. 
On the 29th of December 1812, less than five months after their first meeting, Patrick and Maria were married in a double wedding, alongside her cousin who was marrying William Morgan at St Oswald's Church Guiseley. The men conducted each other's ceremony and the women were bridesmaids to each other. Patrick and Maria set up home in Clough Lane, High Town. Their first child, Maria, was born January 1814, followed by Elizabeth in February 1815. After two years at High Town, Patrick arranged an exchange with the Reverend Thomas Atkinson, who was at that time curate of Bell Chapel at Thornton near Bradford. In 1815, the Brontes moved to Thornton and Patrick became incumbent of Bell Chapel. The parsonage in Market Street was described as a rather drab little house. Patrick and Maria conceived four children whilst at Thornton. Charlton in 1816, the following year Branwell, the only boy, Emily in 1818, and Anne two years later. The Brontes lived at Thornton for five years, and during this time, Patrick organised a complete renovation of the dilapidated Bell Chapel. It was here that Charlotte, Branwell, Emily and Anne were baptised. Sadly, over the passage of time, the old chapel fell into disrepair. Its ruins are now opposite the new church of St James. The Brontes former home at Thornton in 2005 was occupied by the author Barbara Whitehead who wrote Charlotte Bronte and her dearest Nell, Nell referring to Charlotte's old school friend Ellen Nussie. In February 1820 Patrick was appointed perpetual curate at Howarth and moved into the parsonage in April. Seven carts took their furniture and the Bronte family up the steep road to their new home. Maria became terminally ill, suffering from stomach cancer. It was thought that the conditions at Breezy Howarth would be healthier than at Thornton. She died on the 15th of September 1821, 17 months after moving into the parsonage at the age of 38 years. Just before she died, her last words were, Oh God, my poor children. Oh God, my poor children, what will become of them? The children had a lonely life in some respects, with more affection from the servant Tabitha, Tabby, Ackroyd, than from their father. Patrick said their prattle distressed him, reminding him of his dead wife, but they were not harshly disciplined. The only meal he had with them was breakfast, where he encouraged the children to think. Miss Elizabeth Branwell, Maria's sister, travelled from Cornwall to care for the family. She would live at Haworth for 21 years until her death. She was a stern disciplinarian, but a kindly woman with a warm affection for the Bronte children. A devout Methodist, she preached accordingly, leading the children in prayers and hymns. She devoted her life to the children. Aunt Branwell was a good influence on the girls, and gave them simple lessons, taught them sewing and home management. The girls were intensely shy and kept very much to themselves. Patrick seemed to focus on Branwell, teaching him Greek and Latin. He was a popular boy and used to slip out to meet his friends. The town of Howarth consisted chiefly of one long street, stretching up the hill for nearly three quarters of a mile it was a harsh, crowded and unhealthy industrial township. There were no sewers with human waste running down open channels by the side of the paths and streets. And the water supply was both polluted and inadequate. 
Even the parsonage was without proper sanitation. The family and servants shared a double-seater privy in the yard. Branwell spoke of muck middens and the stinking smell of rotting rubbish, of manure heaps all mixed with the odour of wool and oil. In Howarth between 1840 and 1850, there were 1,344 burials over those 10 years. The average lifespan was 25 years and Howarth compared with the unhealthiest district of London. Also a matter of great concern was that four out of every 10 children died before reaching their sixth birthday. The General Health Board published a report in 1850 showing their concern about the close concentration of burial plots at St Michael and All Angels graveyard. The report also pointed out that the flat stones covering many graves, which they claimed prevented the growth of plants from assisting in decomposition, resulted in a deadly seepage from the graves, contaminating the water supply. It was recommended that the graveyard be closed immediately. Howarth Parsonage was built between 1778 and 79 and originally called the Glebe House. It was to be the family's home for the rest of their lives. The fact that Patrick had no independent means was a source of anxiety for the family, for if his health failed, they stood to lose both income and home. In the event, Patrick outlived all of his family. When Patrick finally arrived at Howarth as the perpetual curate at St Michael and All Angels, he was content with his achievement, although he was never vicar of St Michael's, for the Howarth chapelry was still part of the parish of Bradford. St Michael's church being a chapel of ease, catering for those who could not attend service at Bradford Parish Church. William Grimshaw spent 21 years as incumbent at St Michael's. He worked closely with John Wesley and George Whitefield, and within religious circles they became the three greatest men of their time. 1742 saw Grimshaw's arrival at Howarth, 35 years before Patrick Bronte was born. Grimshaw had a great passion for souls and their practical well-being. His preaching style was plain, powerful, straight and practical. Grimshaw had an enormous following and almost immediately on his arrival a revival in church attendance broke out and from 12 communicants his church was soon filled with hundreds inside and hundreds outside. Patrick had a great admiration for the work done by Wesley, Whitefield and especially Grimshaw and it is probably their work at Howarth that attracted Patrick to the township. In ascending the steep hill of Main Street Patrick had completed a personal journey from the vicarage at Thomas Tye in Ireland to possession of the three-tier pulpit where John Wesley, George Whitefield and William Grimshaw had preached all those years ago. The Bronte family pew was at the foot of the pulpit and the topmost part of the pulpit is now to be seen in the Mission Church at Stanbury. The font located in the churchyard to the south side of the church was used by William Grimshaw and is inscribed with his name. By 1824, Patrick and Aunt Branwell felt it was time for the children to receive a more formal education. The two eldest girls had for a short time attended a school at Crofton near Wakefield, but were withdrawn, probably because of the expense. Eventually, a school was selected at Cowan Bridge on the border of the West Riding of Yorkshire, some 40 miles from Howarth. The school, a semi-charitable institution, was founded by Reverend William Carus Wilson for daughters of poor clergymen. Ten-year-old Maria, and nine-year-old Elizabeth were part of the first group of pupils and joined in July 1824. 
The following month, eight-year-old Charlotte joined the school and Emily, six years old, joined in November. Measles and whooping cough had prevented them from starting earlier. The school was strict and authoritarian, founded on a strong belief in corrective discipline in order to subdue the inherent wickedness of children. The food was poorly prepared and the children suffered great discomfort as the school was especially cold in the winter. On Sundays, the children walked over three kilometres across open countryside to Tunstall Parish Church. Reverend Wilson preached at morning and afternoon services. Since it was too far to return home for their midday meal, the children took a cold-packed lunch with them and ate it in a chamber over the entrance. Cold and with their feet often soaked from tramping through the snow and across wet muddy fields, they were forced to remain there all day in the unheated church. In her book Jane Eyre, Charlotte drew heavily on her experiences at Cowan Bridge School, describing it with savage loathing and equating it with Jane's dreadful school Lowood and the Reverend Brocklehurst, whose counterpart in real life was Reverend Wilson. In Elizabeth Gaskell's The Life of Charlotte Bronte, a friend of Charlotte's at Cowan Bridge told of how Charlotte showed physical feebleness in everything. She never played ball games because she was short-sighted. She preferred instead to stand on a stone at the edge of the River Leck, watching the water flow by. The winter of 1824-25 brought sickness. Maria went down with low fever and was sent home on the 14th of February. She died at Howarth 12 weeks later. Meanwhile, Elizabeth was ill with tuberculosis and was forced to return home at the end of May. On the 1st of June 1825, anxious for his other daughters, Patrick set off to bring them back to Howarth. When he arrived at Cowan Bridge, he found that they were staying at Reverend Wilson's seaside house at Silverdale. From there he brought them home to Howarth, where Elizabeth died on the 15th of June 1825, 16 days after her return home from Cowan Bridge. Patrick's remaining daughters never returned to Cowan Bridge. The present-day cottages at Cowan Bridge, set back some distance from the banks of the River Leck, housed the dining room, staff bedrooms and lodgings of the superintendent. Reverend Wilson added a wing at one end of these cottages as classrooms and dormitories, and at the other end a covered veranda for taking exercise in bad weather. The additions were destroyed in a fire after the school closed and the remainder reverted to private cottages. A plaque mounted on the side of the cottages acknowledges their history. The loss of his two elder daughters seemed to distance Patrick Bronte from his other children, who became ever more dependent on one another for they had few opportunities for close contact with other children. For the time being, Charlotte, Emily and Anne would continue their education at home. Branwell probably attended a local school for a short time. He was also instructed by his father when time allowed from his parish duties. A number of servants had worked at the parsonage, but later in 1825, Tabitha Ackroyd arrived, aged 57 years and a widow. She would stay at the parsonage for 30 years and became a great friend of the children and was dearly loved. In the winter of 1830-31, Patrick became seriously ill with a congestion of the lungs, making him concerned for his children's future. If he were to die, they would lose their home which went with the curacy and he had insufficient means to provide for them. When Patrick had recovered, education away from home was again considered. Charlotte's godparents, the Reverend Thomas and Mrs Atkinson, financed her time at Rowhead School, Murfield, and she was enrolled at the new and rather select school in 1831. Rowhead under Miss Margaret Wooler was cheerful and healthily situated in its own large gardens. 
Although taking time to settle in, Charlotte would grow to love the school, and it was here that she made a friend of Miss Wooler, which lasted Charlotte's lifetime. At Roe Head, Charlotte gave the impression of having little conventional learning, so she was placed in a junior class. At first she was utterly miserable, and Ellen Nussie found her a silent, weeping, dark little figure in the large bay window of the schoolroom. Charlotte was poorly off compared to her fellow pupils, as was noticeable from her worn, old-fashioned clothes. She was a delicate child and very short-sighted. She refused to wear her spectacles and held her books within centimetres of her nose in order to read them. Mary Taylor befriended Charlotte soon after her arrival and together with Miss Wooler and Ellen Nussie remained lifelong friends of Charlotte. In July 1832, having completed the school's course of lessons and gained the basic requirements to become a governess, Charlotte left Roe Head and returned to the parsonage to teach her sisters. Three years later, Charlotte returned to Roe Head as a teacher, taking Emily with her. Emily was now 17, and this was the first time she would live away from home since Cowan Bridge School. She was dreadfully homesick, missing her beloved Moors, and in October, just three months after arriving at the school, Emily returned to Haworth. The following January, Anne went to Roe Head School in her place. She remained for two years, leaving in December 1837. Charlotte left her teaching post 12 months later, in December 1838. In September 1838, Emily worked as a teacher at Law Hill School near Halifax, where she remained for approximately six months. Emily had a bitter experience at Law Hill School, and Charlotte was aware of her hardship and fully supported her in leaving after such a short time. Over the years, the Bronte children experienced a number of appointments in their pursuits. In May, June and July 1839, Charlotte worked as a governess for Mrs. Sidgick at Stone Gap Hall, Lothersdale near Skipton. The view from the hall overlooking the Yorkshire Dales must have reminded Charlotte greatly of the Moors at Haworth. From March to December 1841, she was governess for the White family at Upperwood House, Rawdon. All that is left of Upperwood House is this derelict summer house. Branwell occupied the privileged position of the only boy in the family, with all expectations centred on him. Unfortunately, he led a very confused life. In June 1838, he had set up as a portrait painter in Bradford, but returned home in debt 11 months later. He showed great promise, as these portraits of friends and acquaintances demonstrate. From January to June 1840, he worked as a tutor for Mr. Postlethwaite at Broughton in Furness. In October 1840, he worked as a clerk on the Leeds Manchester Railway at Sowerby Bridge, Halifax. In April the following year, he was promoted to clerk in charge at London Foot, Halifax. A year later, he was dismissed for incompetence rather than theft in his account keeping. There was a deficiency of £11.07. Seven Anne spent nine months as a governess for the children of Mrs Ingham, Blake Hall, Murfield, and in May 1840 she worked as a governess for the three daughters of the Reverend and Mrs Robinson at Thorpe Green Hall, Little Ousburn, near York. In January 1843, Branwell joined Anne at Thorpe Green Hall as tutor to the Reverend William Robinson's son, Edmund. This sketch of the hall is by Branwell. Unfortunately, Branwell was accused of making improper advances to Mrs Lydia Robinson, although he argued that Mrs Robinson had in fact made advances to him. Anne was thoroughly ashamed by the affair and left Thorpe Green in June 1845. Branwell was dismissed by Mr Robinson four weeks later. His position at Thorpe Green Hall would be his last job. He was now virtually unemployable. In 
Branwell could not recover from this final blow and turned increasingly to alcohol and opium. He bought his drugs at the apothecaries in Howarth, opposite St Michael's All Saint Church, and spent a great deal of his time at the Black Bull Inn. He was a popular customer at the Black Bull, situated next to St Michael's Church, and even had his own seat there, which is still on show. It is a duplicate of one on display at the Parsonage Museum. Branwell is reputed to have funded his alcohol and drug addiction by gambling with travellers at the Black Bull. It is believed that he was able to write simultaneously with a pen in each hand. He was aided by the landlord who would take bets from travellers and strangers who in many cases doubted his claim. Martha and Mary Taylor, very good friends of Charlotte's at Rowhead School, had moved to Brussels. Mary wrote to Charlotte, describing the wonders of the city. Charlotte and Emily were considering establishing their own school and felt it would be useful to go to a finishing school on the continent. Here they would improve their French and Italian and also learn German. In February 1842, Charlotte and Emily travelled to Brussels to extend and develop their education. They were under the supervision of a young couple Monsieur Heger and his wife. In October 1842, Charlotte and Emily were asked to return to Haworth because of Aunt Branwell's terminal illness. Sadly, she died before Charlotte and Emily reached Haworth. Charlotte, with a pleasing record from Monsieur Heger, returned to Brussels for 12 months to teach English. Despite circulating a prospectus and sending letters to people of note, due to lack of response, Emily and Charlotte's dream of opening a school never materialised. None of the Bronte children would enjoy a long life. They were all destined to die before the age of 40 years. Branwell died on 24th of September 1848 repenting the fact that he had done nothing either great or good in his life. Branwell died of tuberculosis, aged 31 years. In his earlier years, Branwell was a popular and outgoing young man. However, in his final years, much of his time was spent in the nearby Black Bull Inn, and he was described as being stupefied by drugs and alcohol, a danger to himself and everyone else. There were no major achievements in his works, although portraits exist which clearly demonstrate that Branwell was very talented. Perhaps his most famous work is the portrait of his three sisters, misleadingly described as the pillar portrait. There appears to be a pillar in the centre of the painting. It is believed that it was originally a self-portrait of Branwell, and because he was dissatisfied with his self-portrait, he painted himself out. These images of Branwell are two self-portraits. Emily outlived her brother by just three months, dying of tuberculosis here on the sofa in the parsonage parlour, aged 30 years. Her father recorded that she bore her illness up to death with great fortitude and courage, refusing all offers of sympathy. There are two portraits of Emily, both by Branwell, one with her sisters on the pillar portrait and the other a section of the gun group. In 1846, Charlotte, Emily and Anne published at their own expense a book of poems. This was their first venture into publishing their work and they had a feeling that female authors would be viewed unfavourably. So they adopted pseudonyms, each used Belle as their surname, Charlotte opted for Curra as her first name, Emily favoured Ellis, and Anne chose Acton. The identity of the Bells was kept a close secret, and it was only after some confusion with the publishing houses, some two years later, that their true identity came to light. The major works of the three sisters are Charlotte's Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights by Emily, and The Talent of Wildfell Hall by Anne. These novels are ranked with the best in the English language and continue to fascinate readers here in the 21st century, 160 years after the books were published. According to Elizabeth Gaskell, 
author of The Life of Charlotte Bronte, published two years after Charlotte's death. She claims the story of Jane Eyre relates in part to Charlotte's bitter experiences at Cowan Bridge School. Reverend Carus Wilson, founder of the school, was greatly offended over the austere image of his school portrayed in Mrs Gaskell's book, so much so that legal action was threatened. In Anne's The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, she seems to have based her story on Bramwell's life, stressing the evils of opium and the hopelessness of alcoholism. The basis for Emery's Wuthering Heights has puzzled readers for many years. It is thought that Top Withen's farm on the Yorkshire Moors, not far from the parsonage, gave Emily the idea of the heights. She often wandered on the moors, and perhaps the bleak solitude of Top Withen's inspired her thoughts for Wuthering Heights. During her short life, Anne produced some fine works of art. Anne died of tuberculosis in Scarborough and is buried in St Mary's Churchyard, Scarborough. She died on the 28th of May, 1849, aged 29 years. All four of the Bronte children were talented artists, although with the exception of Branwell, this was little known. These two portraits by Emily are of the family pets, Keeper the dog and a Merlin. These are images of Anne on the left from the pillar portrait by Branwell, about 1835. In the centre and to the right, both by Charlotte in 1834 and 1833, respectively. These images of Charlotte are by George Richmond, Royal Academy, in 1850, J.H. Thompson and Branwell. Despite her father originally objecting to any male relationship, Charlotte married her father's curate, Arthur Bell Nichols, on 29th of June 1854. The marriage was a quiet event without many guests, and the service was conducted by the Reverend Sutcliffe Sowden. Patrick thought it inappropriate to attend the church service, and in his absence, Miss Wooler gave her away, and Ellen Nessie was a bridesmaid. Charlotte outlived her siblings. She died six years after Anne on the 31st of March, 1855, aged 38 years, in the early stages of pregnancy. Charlotte was tended by Dr. Amos Ingham, who lived at Ashmount, located in Myth Holmes Lane, quite close to the parsonage. He also tended Patrick Bronte up till his death. The building is now a guest house, this is the original drug cupboard, and interestingly, the original arch from Howarth Old Church stands majestically in the garden overlooking Howarth Valley. Patrick Bronte led a sad and often lonely life. To lose one child would be a tragedy, but to lose his wife Maria and their six children, all at a relatively young age, must have been unbearable. He died aged 85 on 7th of June, 1861. Reverend John Wade succeeded Patrick as perpetual curate of Howarth. He deplored the fact that the parsonage and church had become a place of pilgrimage for hundreds of Bronte enthusiasts. He became disparagingly known as the Envious Wade. In 1879, in an act of what was viewed by many as sheer vandalism, he was responsible for the demolition and rebuilding of the old church with only the old tower remaining. The old tower was extended and the point where the new tower joins the old tower is clearly visible as well as the roof line of the original nave. Externally, the parsonage and its surroundings have changed significantly since the Brontes lived here. It was not until after Patrick's death that all but two of the trees which now dominate the church and parsonage were planted. The two trees flanking the gate in the wall which led to the church were said to be planted by the Bronte family. The gateway through which the Brontes made their way to the church was closed many years ago.
In 1928, the parsonage became a museum and is still very much as the Brontes would have known it. The entrance hall would have been larger than it is today. Charlotte organised builders to enlarge the dining room by taking in part of the hall. She had several structural alterations made to the building. Charlotte's school friend Ellen Nessie described how, after family prayers at 8 o'clock, Patrick would lock and bar the front door at 9. He would slowly climb the stairs to the first landing, where he stopped to wind up the clock. This was a nightly ritual, and the clock is still in operation. The dining room, sometimes called the parlour, was probably the most important room in the parsonage so far as the children were concerned. The three sisters did most of their writing here. They would link arms and walk round and round the dining table discussing their plans for the future. After the deaths of Emily and Anne, Charlotte walked in solitude until late into the night. The servants spoke of their great sadness to hear Charlotte walking on and on alone. While sparsely furnished on their arrival, improvements were eventually made to the dining room. Elizabeth Gaskell noted that the room was enlarged by Charlotte in 1850 and that the prevailing colour was crimson. A pastel portrait of Charlotte by George Richmond adorned the wall above the mantelpiece with the two recesses on each side of the mantelpiece filled with books and the plaster medallion portrait of Branwell is by his sculptor friend Joseph Bentley Leyland. The house would have been lit by a combination of oil lamps and candles. The room would also have been used to entertain visitors. Most of Patrick's parish business would be conducted from this room, which he used as his study. Indeed, it was in this room that he first discovered that his eldest daughter Charlotte was a successful author. She entered the room, carrying a copy of her newly printed book Jane Eyre, and asked her father to read it. He was not the type to enthuse, but did announce to the other children that the book was better than I expected. Patrick purchased this cabinet piano for his children. Its strings are arranged vertically so that the instrument takes up less space. Ellen Nussie described Emily as playing with precision and brilliancy. She had advanced music lessons from a professor in Brussels. Anne also played recalled Ellen, but she preferred soft harmonies and vocal music. She sang a little her voice was weak, but very sweet in tone. Charlotte, it seems, did not play, probably due to her extreme short sight. Anne and Branwell each copied their favourite pieces into manuscript music books. Branwell was an enthusiastic musician, playing the flute and the organ at Howarth Church. The sisters were expected to take their share of the household tasks and the kitchen features in many of their surviving accounts of daily life at the parsonage. As children, the Brontes would gather round the kitchen fire to listen to their servant Tabby's tales of the Yorkshire Moors. After Aunt Branwell's death in 1842, Emily acted as housekeeper, helping in the kitchen and breaking bread. Following Patrick Bronte's death in 1861, his successor, the Reverend John Wade, as well as rebuilding the church, made several alterations to the house, the kitchen being the most affected by the changes. Today the kitchen displays furniture and utensils which belonged to the Bronte family. A kitchen range of the correct period has been added to help recreate the room's original appearance. Opposite the kitchen is the Reverend Nichols' study, according to Elizabeth Gaskell. This room was originally a storeroom, probably used for fuel with access from outside. Before her marriage in 1854, Charlotte converted the room into a study for the Reverend Nichols. A fireplace was added to the room and the present doorway created into the entrance hall. The room has been dedicated to Howarth Old Church, where the Reverend Nichols served as curate for 16 years. <laughs> 
Several relics from the old church have been preserved, including a wooden board depicting the Lord's Prayer. During the Bronte days, the occupants of the rooms upstairs were shuffled around to suit various needs. This was Tabitha Ackroyd's room, the Bronte's favourite and best known servant. She died February 1855, aged 84 years. There were others. Nancy Gars and her sister Sarah accompanied the Brontes from Thornton. They both stayed with the family for several years before leaving to get married. Martha Brown came to the parsonage soon after Tabitha and they worked together for many happy years. She remained until 1861 at the time of Patrick's death. This was the main bedroom described now as Charlotte's room but used by different members of the family depending on who happened to be at home at any particular time. The room was also enlarged at the loss of space in the little room over the hall. Initially this was Patrick and Maria's room. Maria died here in this room and after her death Aunt Branwell moved in. Anne was still a baby and she slept here with her aunt during much of her early childhood. After the deaths of her sisters, Charlotte occupied this room, moving out occasionally if guests such as Elizabeth Gaskell came to stay. This little room was the children's and later became Emily's bedroom. Originally it would have been wider, with room for a full-sized bed across the window, as shown in Emily's diary paper sketch, but it was affected by the enlargement of Charlotte's room. According to Elizabeth Gaskell, the servants called the room the children's study because it was here that the young children would act out their plays and write in their small handmade books. The children scribbled on the wall just inside the door, but sadly over the passage of time their words and drawings have almost vanished. Playing together, the children imagined adventures. That imagination founded its greatest outlet in the fantasy lands of Angria and Gondola, which they created in juvenile literary activity, which far exceeds their adult output. A little 16-page book still survives, which Charlotte wrote for her sister Anne when she was eight years old. In just 125 words, it tells the story of another little girl called Anne. Another survival is a miniature book in which Branwell recorded and illustrated the exploits of his toy soldiers. Patrick later told Mrs. Gaskell that as soon as the children could read and write, they would dream up and act little plays. After the death of his wife in 1821, Patrick left the room that they had shared and moved into the bedroom across the landing, which remained his for the rest of his life. Patrick had lived through periods of Luddite and Chartist violence, to which clergymen often fell victim, and as a result would place a loaded pistol beside his bed at night. It is said that for the safety of his family, and to check the gun was in working order, he discharged the gun by firing it from his bedroom window across the graveyard. At times he would hit the church tower wall, as these gunshot marks illustrate. For much of the time, this room would have been used by Branwell. It is thought that on occasions, when his mind was clouded with drugs and alcohol, and he was a danger to himself and everyone else, for security, he was compelled to share his father's room. At one period, it also served as a studio for Branwell, who had trained to become a professional portrait painter. The museum is administered by the Bronte Society, which was formed by a group of Bronte enthusiasts in 1893. A small museum was established in 1895 in a room above the Howarth Yorkshire Penny Bank. Sir James Roberts, a local businessman, bought the parsonage in 1927 and a year later presented the title deeds to the Bronte Society and in August 1928 the building was opened as a museum and library. In 1962, part of the 1872 extension was redesigned to house personal relics of the Brontes. 
The museum contains a wealth of Bronte memorabilia, which almost transports the visitor back in time to the days of the Bronte family. Inside the church, the Bronte family tomb is marked by an inscription. Although the church was completely altered by Reverend Wade, there still retains an air of tranquility and sense of history. A large marble plaque records the names of the Bronte family. Sadly, Anne is the only member of the family not laid to rest at Haworth. The Bronte Memorial Chapel was inaugurated on the 4th of July 1964 and occupies the southeast portion of St Michael and All Angels. This plaque is in memory of Aunt Branwell, deeply loved by the Bronte children. In a display case near the Memorial Chapel is the marriage certificate of Charlotte and Belle Nichols, dated 29th of June 1854. In a field behind the parsonage, a Bronte meadow has been established. It is a place where visitors can rest and enjoy the splendid countryside. There is more to tell about this outstanding family, but we are unable to tell the full story in such a short period of time. So we close with a few words from Alan Bentley, director of the Bronte Parsonage Museum. It's a museum run by the Bronte Society, which was uh, formed in 1893, uh, and they started their first little museum above the Tourist Information Office in Haworth in 1895. Um, the organisation grew th uh, through that uh, through the early part of the 20th century until they were fortunate to be given the uh, the parsonage here by Sir James Roberts in 1928. He was the man who then owned Saltaire and he'd been brought up on the back streets of Haworth and, um, and had made his fortune and he, he remembered the Brontes. From there, uh, the, really the popularity of the Brontes grew through, the, um, uh, through up until into the 70s when this place was in, incredibly popular. We, the record is uh, that we got 221,000 visitors through and in fact it started to do damage to the house so that there's been a, a conscious decision to, to, to limit the numbers since that, those, those great heights. Uh, but we still get uh, online for about 85,000 visitors through and we, uh, we, we'd like to sort of keep it around that, that, sort, of, that sort of figure to, uh, to look after the building and to make sure people get a good um, experience as they, as they go around. Um, the, uh, the society is still in existence and obviously still runs the, uh, the, the museum. Uh, but it's also it's open for anyone to join um, and uh, they do literary events and uh, have newsletters and run a, um, uh, an academic um, prize for research and, uh, and run an academic journal as well which is also available to people.